Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. to Nightlight. I have another good one for you today. Um, I am so excited about this particular book because I can relate so intimately to so much of it that, that it, it was one of the scariest times. We're, we ha I have with me today Dawn Bauman Brunke, and she's written um, a book called Shadow Animals, How Animals We Fear Can Help Us Heal, Transform, and Awaken. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating book. It's a guide to shadow work with animal teachers, and it explains how the animals we fear or dislike can help us recognize and investigate our shadow side, the hated and abandoned, judged, and denied aspects of ourselves. She explores the lessons of a wide variety of shadow animals, including snakes, rats, bats, and spiders, as well as those that only seem shadowy to some, such as dogs, cats, birds, and horses. She looks at the elements of the psyche of each shadow animal and, and presents 13 animal-inspired exercises designed to examine, embrace, and integrate our shadow selves. We often project qualities onto animals that we don't wish to admit in ourselves, thus Snakes are evil, spiders are creepy, rats are dirty, and so on. As she explains, the animals we fear or dislike can help us to recognize our own shadow, the hated, abandoned, judged, and denied aspects of ourselves. As teachers and guides, shadow animals can help us to reclaim the inner strengths, abilities, and wisdom that we've forgotten or disowned. She explores the lessons of, of the animals, including those that many of us are repelled by, such as snakes and bats, and, and those that only seem shadowy, like dogs and cats. Though shadow animals may initially appear frightening, they often prof, um, offer profound healing and expert guidance in helping us identify, learn from, and embrace our shadow selves. She explains how shadow animals represent unexamined elements of the psyche, from secret fears and suppressed emotions to the unacknowledged prejudices and repressed traumas. She presents 13 different animal-inspired exercises, each uniquely designed, designed to help us find and better understand those lost, wounded pieces of our own psyche. She is an author, animal communicator, and dream enthusiast. enthusiast. She's written eight books and designed a tarot deck, all of which focus on connecting at deeper levels with animals, nature, self, and spirit. She offers animal communication sessions, tarot readings, and a variety of in-person and online workshops. She is, to say the least, a fascinating person who has wisdom from strange and wonderful places that help us to become whole again. So welcome to the show, Dawn. Hi, Barb. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's it's such a pleasure. Uh, I I 
animals are one of my favorite topics, and I had never, it had never occurred to me that um, those those animals that I'm not fond of could reflect something about myself that I hadn't yet dealt with. So um, mm-hmm. it it was it was amazing, and you know everybody has a shadow self. I mean, we all have them as part of our makeup and. And over time, hopefully, we deal with some of those aspects. But, but going at it from from the concept of animals that that we are repelled by um, helps us, you know, get at some of those shadow selves that we might not have claimed otherwise. And mm-hmm. yeah. and other and it, it helps us to really become lighter in in many unique and different ways. And this doesn't mean, though, I, I think I should put out there, it doesn't mean that you have to suddenly take an animal that has been a fearful experience for you and you don't necessarily have to make it a pet. It's, it's right, just right. telling us, you know, it's just telling us something about ourselves because, to be perfectly honest, I have a fear of snakes that is, you know, ridiculous. And, mm-hmm. and you know, and, and yet... And I am aware to to some degree as to, you know, all of these animals, no matter how uh, creepy crawly they appear to be, have very positive aspects to them that I hadn't really even considered. And, and can we start with snakes? Because that's, that's my main, that's my main sure. focus when it comes to what animals I would, you know, I run like a yeah. like a scared whatever from. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, and you're not alone. There's so many people who have um, reactions towards snake. In fact, my dad, my father, has his whole family has a huge snake phobia. Um, he can't if there if there's a picture of a snake on the television or in a, in a magazine, he has to turn away. I mean, it's very severe. Um, oh, wow. And, yeah, yeah. Some people have very strong reactions to their shadow animal, if you will. Interestingly, it was actually Snake that kind of brought me to this book. Um, the book I wrote previously was called Awakening the Ancient Power of Snake. And it was all about Snake. And the way that book came about was from a dream. I had a dream. Um, I was actually really in pain. It was the winter solstice. And I was lying in bed. My husband and daughter were decorating the you know, the holidays uh, in the other room, and um, I had these intense back spasms. And I was just kind of in that, you know, woozy state, and I said, what do I need to know? And I saw in my mind's eye an immense snake. It was huge, ancient, archetypal. And that snake engaged me in a series of dreams. And um, it's it's just a long story, but the short version is that next morning after the dreams, I woke up and my back pain was gone. And I had a newfound um, enthusiasm, if you will, for snakes. I I, I had never uh, reacted one way or another to snakes. I just, I didn't, you know, necessarily like them or dislike them. But suddenly I was fascinated by snake. And I remember that morning I just began a lot of research. It was almost as if I was like, how had I never noticed snake before? You know, I had written many animal books, I dealt with a lot of different animal species, but snake was never uh, really up there, really prevalent in, in my work. And um, uh, through research, through the dreams, I just became much more um, interested, intrigued, fascinated by snake. And we ended up actually rescuing two snakes and living with a ball python and a corn snake, Carl and Chloe. <laughs> So I learned firsthand what it's like to live with snakes, what their needs are, what their desires are. Um, and I did learn, uh, just to bring it back to you, I, I, I learned how so many people were so frightened of snakes. We had some people visiting our neighbors, and um, they had two children, and the boys wanted to come over to see the snake. But the mom had a terrible phobia, just, I mean, really, really, really severe, to the point where she didn't even want to come in the house. So I said, well, that's okay, you don't have to come in. But she came in anyway, and 
We got our snakes out. They're both very gentle snakes. Corn snakes are incredibly friendly snakes, and um, ball pythons are, you know, they're kind of slow and moving snakes. So both of our snakes were very friendly. The boys were interacting. And about half an hour later, I noticed the, the mom going, hmm, do you think I could touch that snake? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know. So the enthusiasm of her children and seeing that these snakes were not dangerous, these particular snakes, I'm not saying about all snakes, um, but these particular snakes, you know, they weren't going to harm her. They were very friendly. They were happy to interact with humans. And it shifted her whole worldview, you know, about snakes. So that's one of the things I emphasize in the book is that when we engage our fascination with a particular animal that we may formerly have had bad thoughts about or, you know, uh, been afraid of, um, it can shift. That fascination, that fear can shift into fascination. And we begin to open up to an entirely new uh, relationship with that animal. Well, I know that um, it, it also has, I mean, the Egyptians worshipped them. I mean, they, they, they have represented wisdom in many cultures. And, right. And yet, right. you know, it, it's sort of like, um, at, at least with me, it's, it's, I just, somebody said that there was, you know, I, I live in Tennessee and there's a stream behind me and, so there are copperheads around. Now, I've mm-hmm. never seen one. And mm-hmm. somebody said they saw a, a baby copperhead on their back patio, which I, I live in co- a condo, so it's right next door to me. And I literally took masking tape and I sealed my door out to my outside patio so a snake couldn't crawl in. Mm-hmm. And yeah. You know, in looking in looking back at it now, if I look at the the wisdom that snakes have represented in in history, um, it, it it was kind of like, am I avo- am I avoiding something about history? Am I avoiding something about my personal history or history as a whole? Um, and and I've never had a snake come up on my patio. Um, I've mm-hmm. never seen a snake here. Um, I lived in the woods in Connecticut where there are snakes all around, but one never came into my yard. So mm-hmm. it had one, I, 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 you know, I, I would have panicked, but, but they didn't. And so it, it's sort of like by, by having, you know, somebody, you know, suggest a snake and, and have, feel my, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, it was like, what am I avoiding? Am I mm-hmm. avoiding learning something about myself? Am I learning about yes, somebody yes. else? And then I, you know, it, it's kind of like it has to come back to me. What about me was I not learning? And um, right. I, I did a lot of work on that. You know, it's it's not something that happens overnight. But but I think that there there was wisdom that I assimilated when I was looking for what wisdom about myself have I not paid attention to that I should? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it did, it did help. It really did help. But, mm-hmm. but your book did help me tremendously too. Um, when I, and, and I like the fact that you picked on, on species that <laughs> are not necessarily pets. Um, mm-hmm. You, you went, you went into to bats and you went into, Mm -hmm. Did you go into ants? Because that that was another, I can't remember if you did ants or not. There's a a chapter of insects. But let me just, before we go on to that, I would just like to circle back to something about um, what you said about snake and ancient wisdom. And, you know, I think uh, part of our uh, collective fear of snakes, and again, you're not alone. There's many people who get the heebie-jeebies over snakes or who fear snakes or who even project that snakes are evil in some way, you know. Um, and that goes that goes back that that's a cultural thing I think that has happened. And you're right. In ancient times, snake snake is, is the most mentioned animal um, in terms of creator god, um, in terms of uh-huh. um, offering wisdom and advice to the gods and goddesses to the royalty. You know, in Egypt, like you said, a snake was very important and very much valued for its wisdom. 
you know, here's an animal whose eyes are always open, who can go into the ground, who can see secrets, who is able to shed and offer aspects of healing, you know. So there's so, and I'm just mentioning a few, but there's so many aspects of snake um, that I think we once valued and honored. And somewhere along the line, you know, when we might kind of key into the Garden of Eden story when, you know, uh, that kind of was written, uh, Snake uh, became a villain in some ways. Snake took the fall. Snake was the Uh deceiver, you know. And I think over time, we become very disconnected from Snake is is one example of one species. I mean, there's other animals we've become disconnected to, but Snake especially. And just to tie this to your observation about – you know, <laughs> excuse me, what, what wisdom am I, am I disconnected from in myself? You know, one of the very important aspects of snake is as kundalini. Kundalini is an Eastern word meaning the sleeping serpent, which has kind of represented the unawakened energy at the base of our spine. That when we become, you know, when we engage the path to enlightenment, that energy travels up our spine and comes out through our crown chakra, rather like a snake rising up, right? So there is something, I think, about snake that speaks to our inherent wisdom. And I think that's uh, one of the conclusions I came to when I wrote my chapter on snake in here is that um, I think many individuals are afraid of that. You know, we tend, uh, we, we often tend to give our power away to the government, to, you know, to authority figures, to other people, rather than kind of taking responsibility for our own wisdom our own intuitive insights, things like that. So I think that's the aspect of snake that, um, you know, as a culture we've become a little bit divorced from. And I think we're reclaiming it. I think this, this is a time when we're reclaiming some of that wisdom. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a good reason why snake is a great shadow animal and a great shadow teacher, you know. It's an animal that has a lot of positive and negative qualities, you know. It's a it's a healer, but it can also harm. It's a creator, but it can destroy. So snake also embodies paradox. And, again, something humans are often very uncomfortable with. You know, we kind of want things to be one way or the other. So um, I think snake speaks to all of this. And, um, again, just to tie into what you said about uh, wisdom, yes, I think it has to do with, uh, you know, unrecognized or unclaimed wisdom that we have within ourselves. Um, and our own our own divinity in some ways, huh? Does, does sometimes does a does a shadow animal become a power animal for you? I think so. I think I think that's the ultimate, um, you know, kind of end of the journey is that something that you're so divorced from and so afraid of. Um, once you open yourself to that and become, like I said, fascinated, you begin to learn about it, you um, become vulnerable in a way and open to the teachings, you know, as a student, really become a student of snake, for example, or of another animal. And um, I do think that the more we put into it that authentically, genuinely, you know, really wanting to learn, I think animals respond or animal energies respond to us. And, yes, I do think that our shadow animals can become our power animals. And I would go so far as to say I think they can become our most powerful power animal. Well, yeah, you know, it's funny because I've often said to people, every 10 years I change dramatically, whether it's my hair or my attitude or what I do with life. And, And, you know, when you see a snake shedding its skin, it does become a new a new a new snake, so to speak. And you yeah. know, I, I have found, I've noticed, I've noticed that quality in my life that every decade um, there's something about me that is very new and and um, hopefully precious. <laughs> well, you know but, what's, interesting um, about, uh, what's interesting about a snake shedding its skin is, you know, a snake has to do with transformation, the gift of transformation. Um But unlike, for example, a butterfly, a butterfly, you know, from a a caterpillar to a butterfly, that's a very dramatic transformation of one thing into another. Snake is always Uh snake. When snake sheds its skin, yes, it sheds its old skin, its old, 
you know, kind of opaque scales, and it becomes bright and new, but it's still snake. So snake is, I think, about evolving ourselves in brighter ways and becoming more realized, more aware and awake. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a specific aspect of transformation, I think, that snake speaks to. Yeah, it just, um, it, you know, I, I was so, you know, I, I when I when I was looking through your book before I actually read it, I thought, oh, sure, she's she's going to make she's going to make rats something that that can represent wisdom to us, and and you did. I mean, <laughs> you. <laughs> I thought, and 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 I never came. I never had as I was reading through the book. I never. Um, got to the place where I said, oh, she's stretching it so far here. This is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Spiders. I, I, I became, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an advocate of spiders. I don't like them particularly. And I wouldn't have one as a, as a pet. But I so admire the beauty of their webs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, well, it's so true, isn't there it? Is I mean, a... all animals, all animals have a wisdom. All animals have a teaching. So, you know, if you have a shadow animal, then maybe and you want to work with shadow, then your task is to find out what that teaching is and what it speaks to and what wisdom it offers you, right? I mean, that's kind of the work of the book. Oh yeah. Well, it's funny because I've been fascinated with spider webs probably all my life. Um, not the spider, but the web. And over 50 years ago, I started to paint mandalas, and they, in in many ways, are like creating a web of, mm-hmm. of uh, spiritual insight and wisdom and stuff like that. So, you know, I can see how aspects of some of the animals that I'm not particularly fond of um, have given me insight into something I create in myself that, that mm-hmm. has great beauty. So, right. you know, yeah. I, have, I, have yet, I have yet to figure out ants. Ants um, have plagued me almost in every place I've lived. Not, not knock on wood where I am now, but I always, you know, it, and, I, and I've, not, I've had trouble to figure out what is so great about ants. <laughs> well, do you want to go into that a little bit? I mean, ants are interesting. Yeah, let's um, let's go into ants. <laughs> you know, ants have been around since the time of dinosaurs. Did you know that? No. They're an ancient species. Yeah, they've been around since the time of dinosaurs. You know, they're very intelligent. Um, you know, they know how to construct. They're socially minded. They work together collectively to make incredible structures, to even make bridges where they walk around one another. Um, They don't have ears, but they listen by feeling vibrations. And they communicate with each other um, through chemicals. Their language is actually chemicals. Um, You know, there's just so many fascinating things about ants. They're so small, but they're able to lift up 50 times their own body weight. And they can join forces with other ants to transport even heavier objects. So there's a, there's almost a magical quality about ants. I mean, they do, they're small, but they have to do with power. They have to do with um, working well with others. They have to do with very subtle communications. You know, it's not a language, it's a chemical language, right? I mean, can, can we even, uh, uh, you know, sense what that is? It's just very different um, than us. Um, what else about ants? I mean, what's your main uh, what's your main fear of ants? It's not a fear. It's just that I I don't want them in my kitchen, and I have I have done everything I could <clears throat> where I lived. I finally sold the house, but not because of the ants. But um, uh-huh. I I really I really worked on trying to communicate with them to say you know. Just you know, stay outside. Don't come in. It's mm-hmm. summertime. Mm-hmm. You don't need to come in. There's no food here for you. And mm-hmm. I mean, I did everything trying to. Um, <laughs> the one thing I did, which somebody said to put um, paprika 
on the window sills and you know it would it would you know it it would turn them away and by accident i put cinnamon down so <laughs> i sort of i i invited them in for lunch really yeah, you're bad yeah <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, there's an old story by Jay. Are you familiar with Jay Allen Boone, the writer? He was yeah. a, a writer back. He was a war correspondent back in the 1940s and 50s, and he ended up um, caretaking a, one of the first German Shepherd, um, one of the first dog movie stars in America. It was a German Shepherd named Strongheart, and he was he became fascinated by. Uh, 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 connecting with animals, and he was convinced that Strong Heart, this German Shepherd, had taught him how to really understand dogs and understand in a deeper level. And so anyway, he wrote a wonderful little book. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it right now, Kinship with All Life. And I think it's in that book or one of his next books where he spoke about uh, ants and how ants were invading his house and what to do about the ants. And he didn't feel like it was proper just to say, you can't come in the house. So he did what he calls a gentleman's agreement with the ants. And I can't recall now what exactly it was. It seems like maybe he offered the ants some, something or he offered them respect, perhaps. You know, a lot of this is energetic, right? So he offered uh-huh. them res- a, a respectful um, uh, explanation of why he needed them out of the house, and, and they agreed. So he did it energetically. And he did it not by force or manipulation, but by, again, what he called a gentleman's agreement. Um, and I think uh, the reason I tell the story is I think there is some um, uh, wisdom in how we relate to animals energetically. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, we're a society that, you know, ants or rats or something invades your house. Let's get chemicals. Let's bomb the house. Let's, you know, without any regard for the insect or the, or the, or the mammal or whatever it is. Um, and again, I think that's just a, a reflection of our own disconnection from life, from nature, you know. So a, a lot of this speaks to, you know, it, it may be more difficult to kind of discern exactly what it is with ants. It's sort of a, you know, might require a little bit more of a deep dive. But what part of me is disconnected from nature? What part of me fears invasion? You know, what part of me, um, you know, uh, Perhaps it has to do with collectivity because it's not just one ant that's invading, it's many ants. And what do the ants want? You know, we begin to ask questions that have meaning. And that's a way of kind of teasing this information and getting deeper within ourselves so that we can communicate or commune in better ways with um, uh, our shadow animals. Does that make sense to you? Oh, yeah. No, it does. Definitely. Uh, I think mm-hmm. that you know, so many, so many times people just go, "Ooh, I don't want to talk about it. I want to get near it." And you know, they they just they're 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 physically repelled by by um, some of some of these animals, and mm-hmm. um, it's 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 yeah, you know, I for the most part, I've made friends with most of the animals that. Um, have have lived around and, and with me, you know the 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 bees and you know all of them, but but mm-hmm. you know there there are some that just um, I mean even bats are are really kind of cuddly. I mean I you know mm-hmm. they're not vampires, but you know they 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 mm-hmm. really are kind of cuddly, except for the ugly wings. But but um, you know and I've always welcomed them. You know I've always. Um, I, I do. I am an animal communicator to a degree. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I go into Alpha and I send messages to my cat, and she actually understands them. And actually, sometimes even, you know, she'll either do what I ask her, or I get an I don't think so, not now. But, um, you know, it, it there there is communication there, and I kind of when when I read your book, it, it made such great sense to me that you know if there was an if there was an animal that that you know really terrified me and snakes do but you know i can you know i even have you know little salamanders that are around here and they don't bother me but um mm-hmm. a snake does so 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 i'm wondering if 
if not only is there wisdom to be gained from the whole thing, or if there there is possibly a trauma from a past life that is that is working as well inside of me when it comes to this. Yeah, well, that could be too. I mean, you know, what comes to mind as you speak about that is perhaps taking time to sit and explore that with snakes. You know, explore within yourself. Is there trauma here that needs to be healed? And, you know, if you have animal communication abilities, you certainly have the ability to communicate with your deep self and to start opening, inviting, huh? Um, you know, images, thoughts, insights, perceptions to come up. And, I mean, if it is rooted in a uh, a trauma from your childhood or from past life or whatever, or alternate life, um, you know, those can be retrieved and those can be looked at. And once we look at it, it's just like shadow. Once we look at our shadow, once we acknowledge our shadow and embrace our shadow, it's really no longer shadow. You know, it's up for integration. Right. And, you know, that's how that's how a shadow animal becomes a power animal because we've gone to the root of the shadow. We've healed, in a sense. We've acknowledged and accepted um, and embraced. And everything shifts once that happens, right? Everything shifts. Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, I think one of the things that, you know, when when, when you mentioned dogs, cats, birds, and horses, I thought, oh, my goodness. And now I'm a cat person. Um, mm-hmm. I have a cat major and a dog minor. Um, but I have actually met people that are terrified of cats. And mm-hmm. so... Yeah. What <laughs> I just find it so hard to believe that something. Okay, I'll grant you they have teeth and they have teeth and nails, but um, how? What aspect of a person could be reflected in a fear of a cat? Well, I'll give you a personal example, and I want to say from the outset, however, that you know we all have different aspects of shadow. So what's shadow for yeah. one person, for you snake, isn't necessarily shadow for another. I have no shadow on snakes. I like them, you know. Um, what's shadow, mm-hmm. uh, I love dogs, and yet I have a friend who is a very afraid of dogs and who doesn't like to be near dogs and who doesn't, you know, doesn't even like to look at them. So, you know, it's just like in the world. We all have different aspects of shadow. We all have different aspects of what we like, what we don't like. Um, For me, I was never, this goes back to my uh, childhood, I I was never afraid of cats or had anything. I really, I was a dog person, all right? I just love dogs. That's me. (laughs) And um, I I, I never hated cats or anything like that. I mean, I always thought they were uh, beautiful and very graceful. Um, But one day when I was probably about nine years old, I went with my mom and my sister to visit my mom's friend who had three cats. And it was fine. Nothing, there was no problem. Uh, and in the morning, I went downstairs to get a glass of milk, and the eldest cat, a gray cat with green eyes, was sitting there in front of the refrigerator. And it looked at me in such a way that I suddenly felt scared. I mean, it wasn't menacing. It didn't hiss. It didn't do anything like that. But it, 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 it was as if it looked inside of me, and it found me wanting. It found something in me either not good enough or whatever. I mean, that was my... Uh, inside at the time, my feeling at the time. And I turned and I ran. I ran up the stairs, jumped on my mama's bed. The cat followed me and jumped on the bed. Uh, well, the, the cat didn't jump on the bed. I jumped on the bed. And the cat never touched me. And I didn't, you know, it, it sort of was a funny incident. And, and we kind of all laughed about it. And um, but and I, I, didn't, I didn't hate that cat. I mean, it was fine the rest of the day. But here's what's really interesting is about a week later, I was by a cat, and I started sneezing, and my eyes started getting watery. And every time I met a cat, I had an allergic reaction. And I soon became so allergic to cats. I mean, even if I was in the same room with a cat, I would sneeze. My eyes would get red. I'd get itchy. um, That I just realized it's better to avoid cats. You know, again, I didn't hate them, but I wanted to avoid them. So it wasn't until I was in college that I started dreaming of a cat. And long story short, that cat kind of became a teacher in the dream world and helped me move past this incident with cats. And I think it had to do with that original, um, you know, perception that that cat 
was seeing something in me, maybe that I wasn't acting up to my potential. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but it had to do with self-worth. It had to do with uh-huh. um, how I presented myself in the world. And it wasn't until I went into that shadow, again, at a much later date, because at age nine I would have been incapable pretty much of, you know, <laughs> navigating that yeah. and the emotions of that. But at age 20, you're at a different place. And so Cat has become really, in many ways, um, a, a shadow animal turned power animal for me. And a lot of times when I have dreams of Cat, it's with great wisdom and great respect. Um, that, uh, in other words, I have great respect for cats um, when that wisdom comes through. So, again, I guess my answer to your question is that, you know, everyone's different, and we all have different um, experiences with animals, and why a certain animal will be shadowed for us um, may be completely different for another individual, yeah? Uh-huh. It just, it just... Um... You know, you 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 have gone, you know, from from, you know, rats and bats and spiders to the the soft and cuddly stuff. And mm-hmm. I mean, I do know um, I do know people that that um, are terrified of cats, and, mm-hmm. and yeah. it just uh, it, it's I I guess it it just. You know, it's, it's an inner something that everybody has to doesn't have to, but everybody can deal with to see, you know, what's at the base of this and um, yeah. how can we fix it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, but, if you, um, to, you know, I, I would feel like it's an invitation. You know, are you up for it? Is that what you want to do? And I think, in general, my experience is that animals are often very, very um, happy to help us and happy to go there with us, especially into our um, our shadow material. You know, there's some animals that kind of excel at that. I think cats are very good at going into the shadow. You know, they're comfortable in the shadows. They're comfortable in the dark. They can see in the dark. They're kind of, you know, uh-huh. they can have a sneaky quality, and they can help us in that way to kind of sneak into our shadow and and work with it, to work in the dark with the shadow and retrieve the wisdom or the insights that we need um, to reintegrate that into our into ourselves. Have you found that that when dealing with any with any animal that there is a way of communicating with it? Um, you know, uh I, I realize they don't, you know, if, if this is not Harry Potter and you can't speak to snakes the way he did, but um, but do animals mostly respond to, to pictures that are sent in alpha? Um, I think it's different for uh, each individual human as well as different animals. You know, some animals are very visual, and it's easier to communicate with them visually. Some animals are more uh-huh. kinesthetic. Snake, for example. You know, a lot of my communications with snake were very kind of kinesthetic and movement-oriented. Um, some animals are more auditory. So I think, you know, one of the things I teach in animal communication classes is really to be very open with your senses so that you can communicate in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, some animals are very... Um, Kind of, it's like a gestalt, you know, like whales, for example, in my experience, are you kind of get the woof, huh. the kind of the big picture, and just that's what it is, you know. Whereas dogs and cats, you know, they know our day, they're often with us, they kind of understand our story to the point where, you know, they understand time as we understand time often, often. Um, they understand our, oh, yeah. uh, our unique likes and dislikes. So, you know, whereas if you talk with a wild tiger, they're going to be like, yeah, we don't have time like that. You know, it's dark, it's wide, it's it's jungle time, it's whatever it is. So they just have a different experience. So um, in terms of being a good uh, human communicator, I think it has to do with flexibility and adaptability and kind of very being open on the spectrum to um, both your senses and how you translate. Um, information that you get from other animals. Yeah. Well, let's let's go into to rats. Um, All right. Because let's let's go into to 
the qualities that rats represent that that could could definitely be something someone was working on because I, I know when I read the book, you know, I I always think of rats as dirty, and they're actually not. They're actually very clean. Yeah, they really are. And, and you know, try to explain that to somebody who has this preconceived idea that rats are dirty and you just can't do it. But if you do the research, you'll realize that rats are actually very clean animals. Yeah. They're smart. You know, they're very clever. They're savvy. They're they're persistent. You know, rats can get out of obstacles that many others can't. Um, and they're adaptable. Uh-huh. They're incredibly clever. You know, they really can um, uh uh, be presented with a, a challenging situation and figure out an answer. So I think rats are, um, uh, yeah, pretty amazing. <laughs> what did you want to know? What more do you want to know about rats? I mean, well, they're also <clears throat> the collectors, aren't they? I mean, I know one of the things I emphasized in that chapter, or that I, I spoke about, didn't really emphasize, is that rats, rats are collectors. They're kind of recyclers. You know, they take human garbage, and they will adapt it. You know, they might use it for their uh-huh. nest. They might tear it up and do different things with it. Um, they're very creative in that sense, right? Well, you know, they're I think... They're very affectionate it, to their children or to their yeah, own and, humans. Yeah. I think that and the other thing that, that um, you know, you mentioned birds. And I have a, a friend who is terrified of ravens. And ravens mm-hmm. are so intelligent, and they mm-hmm. collect stuff. And right. and right. you know, ravens were were often with the Native Americans. They are they are the ravens are the vehicle that the they take you know your dreams and your requests of the gods up to the gods. So they're mm-hmm. they're 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 incredible creatures. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and. And they have they have a group memory which is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. So you know somebody afraid of, of birds of any sort. Um, I mean, if something lands on your head, yeah, you're going to say, "Oh, what 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 was that?" But but um, ravens are amazing, and and yet because they're I don't know if it's because they're black and and you know they they appear to be they're loud. <laughs> But but I, I think ravens well, are, are one of the most and amazing. Are, yeah, they, I, do, I do too. We have ravens here in Alaska, and I love watching the ravens. They're amazing creatures. Um, you know, uh-huh. but there's something in the history of ravens that they're tricksters. They, you know, so a trickster is always one of those liminal animals that's sort of one way. You can't quite count on it. Raven figures in a lot of myths. Um you know, both Judeo-Christian as well as Native American and other myths. Um, and, and, and uh-huh. you know, raven sometimes helps humans and sometimes harms humans in those Native American myths. There's, there's many of them. They're wisdom keepers, but they also yeah. tell secrets. You know, as tricksters, they kind of let, let loose on, 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 uh, on the mystery and on secrets, and they'll give you a little bit of information, but not all of it. Um, Carl Jung also felt that the raven was an archetype of transformation. It was a really uh, – he, he had an interesting take on it. He saw a raven as kind of a, an aspect of the deep psyche that would help to bring change when we've re- reached the limits of our abilities. So he saw raven almost as a an angelic force. He didn't call it that. I'm calling it that, but kind of a dark angel that would bring up information uh-huh. from the un- unconscious that we needed when we were ready, you know, when we readied ourselves and when we were open to the teaching that we couldn't access on our own. So there's a power about Raven, I think, um, and it's definitely rooted in the way, in their mythology and the way we understand Ravens. Um, so uh, Ravens are definitely, I think, a shadow animal. Um, and by virtue of their trickster nature, they can help us, be more aware of both our light and our dark. You know, tricksters hold that balance, right? Uh-huh. They hold the light and the dark. And I think um, when we're exploring our shadow self, 
you know, basically what we're doing is we're looking at what we judge, what the secrets we keep from ourselves, huh? Shadow material is rich uh-huh. with um, things that we don't want to look at, that we don't want to see. And so Raven, if Raven is the one that brings that to light or the light of awareness to the world, yeah, there's reasons why people aren't going to, you know, embrace Raven because Raven brings us the things we don't necessarily want to see. And yet ultimately Raven brings us the pieces of our own enlightenment. So so it's a paradox. It's a little bit of a paradox. Yeah. Well, I think what's so important about your book is that, you know, while while everyone will admit, you know, we have, everyone has a shadow self. Everyone has a shadow self. There is nobody mm-hmm. out there, I don't believe, without a shadow. Um, I, I don't think, it's like Peter Pan, you, you can't be complete without your shadow. Um, mm-hmm. So it's, 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 it's that aspect of it that, that is there for us to recognize and to grow through and to understand and to embrace. And Mm-hmm. Most people sitting, you know, sitting listening will say, "Well, how the hell do I figure out what, you know, what I need to look at?" And and knowing that 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 there is a, a way to figure out some of what that shadow represents by looking at what animal really um, turns you aside. I don't know. I don't want to say revolts you, but but maybe even mm-hmm. that. Um, mm-hmm. And, and you know, if you're looking for part of your shadow, won't be all of it, but if you're looking for a part of your shadow to work on and to bring greater light into yourself, taking the animal that, that you know, frightens you, that, that you steer away from, that you aren't really drawn to, and taking a look at the aspects of that animal and realizing that if you have a fear of it, if you're resisting it, you're probably resisting something consciously that is subconsciously important for you to reconcile with. And right. it, right. it, it really mean, helps. It, 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 it's a great way of doing therapy without actually going to a shrink. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, it's to say, you know, what's my shadow? All you have to do is say, what do I really not like? You know, whether it's an animal or yeah. whether it's the government or, you know, my last chapter in this book is the most dangerous shadow animal of all, humans. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> we do it to ourselves. Well, we have massive shadow out there right now. Um, such incredible divisiveness, wars, you know, hatred, um, refusing to listen to others. So, yeah, shadow is running amok right now in the world. And, you know, for somebody who goes, what's my shadow, I'd be like, watch the news. What what irritates you? You know, that's your shadow right there. So whatever, if you want to do in terms of animals, what animal do I most dislike or gives me the heebie-jeebies, you know, that's your shadow. It's showing you something. It's showing you something. And, and I, um, I guess I think one, well, once you've, dealt with that aspect that, that this is addressing something that, you know, you need to deal with or, or awaken yourself to, that, then it's easy, easier to transfer it over to, okay, so what else am I avoiding in life? That, that has to be part mm-hmm. of a shadow mm-hmm. too. And yeah. once, you, once you realize what a shadow is, then it can become anything from Diet Coke to an animal to a person. And yeah, what, I does, agree. what I agree. do those things, <clears throat> you know, what do those things represent? And then if you sit down and you really honestly look at stuff, um, then, you, then you do begin to re- recognize qualities within yourself that, that need to be adjusted or recognized or embraced and, and it, it makes, you know, you're always going to have a part of shadow. There's always going to be shadow in your life. There really is. That's the only way we grow. But but sometimes figuring out what is shadow to you is very, very hard. But you've opened the door with this that is just so amazing. It's It's really phenomenal. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> but I do agree with you in, the, in terms of once you start looking at it, and once you start recognizing shadow in the world, in yourself, 
it does become easier, and I would even go so far as to say it becomes a little more fun. You know, I mean, I remember oh, yeah. writing this book. I mean, you, I couldn't have written this book if I wasn't willing to deal with some aspects of shadow, right? So the more I did right. it, the more I became really super tuned into, you know, why is that irritating me? Or what is that? Why is that? Why am I, you know, annoyed by that person? So it becomes little things. And, um, you know, once you get the big things out of the way, then the little things, you start working on that. And it's, it's, it's like cleaning, you know, it's like you start cleaning and lightening up. And and I I got to the point where I wanted to do it more and more because I just felt so much better. You know, I'm not carrying this baggage oh, yeah. anymore. You know, there's this great poet, Robert Bly, he called shadow the long bag we drag, we drag behind us, you know. And and he, he <laughs> said our shadow, our shadow bag is just full of all this stuff from our childhood, middle school, high school, you know, our parents, our everything, right? So once you start unpacking that, you become lighter and lighter. And you're, now you're carrying, you know, a backpack or a knapsack. You're not carrying a long bag. Um, and it becomes smaller and smaller. Yeah. Well, I think also it makes you more aware when 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 you are annoyed by or revolted by or whatever, that that you don't just say, oh, you know, that really bugs the hell out of me. It's kind of like, you know, bug being the operative word here, um, you know, you 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 try to figure out why, mm-hmm. and yeah. and it isn't it isn't it isn't just acknowledging that you're annoyed by something, but why, and right. how can you right. be a better person in dealing with that why, and it right. it just it makes you more attuned to all other aspects of life. You know, you you don't have to yeah. suddenly, you know, have, have a menagerie here, but but um, there is that aspect of beginning to understand what a shadow is and how you deal with it, and that's why what you've done here is you've you've made it so concrete that people can understand. You know, okay, the, so this is a part of my shadow self, and let me investigate this and let me find the positive and negative qualities and relate them to myself and and deal with this issue. And I think that that's that's such an important gift to give to people. This isn't just a book to read for the fun of it. This is a book to learn from and to grow from. And and I think that, um, you know, I've given it to a number of people and, and, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for my feedback as to, did you understand what this was, or did you just think it was a cool book? I mean, it is a cool book, mm-hmm. but but applying it to yourself is a whole other ball of wax. And and I do find myself every now and then, if I'm annoyed by something or if something upsets me or whatever, I stop and I say, okay, this is something I need to deal with. I I don't have, you know, if it's a person, I don't have to deal with that person, but I have to understand why. I am Mm -hmm. turned off or annoyed by or whatever. And and if that's a quality that maybe I have in me that I want to adjust or come to better terms with so that I learn from from everything that annoys me. And often there's plenty. But, um, but you know, and and not everything is a shadow. But, you know, some things are just damn annoying. But, yeah. And then, 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 you know, figuring... It, it 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 it's a it's a wonderful book and and I think that that you're going to make a lot of people really put a lot of thought into things as they as they read through it. It's it's an educational book. It's uh it's, it's an well, easy read. Yeah, well, thank you. And and uh, I think you mentioned in the beginning there's each chapter has an exercise at the end. It ends with a very concrete exercise of how can I do something? And the, those exercises are meant to be kind of a buffet. So there's different ways. You know, some people are very mental. They like to figure things out rationally. So there's exercises for that. There's other people that are more, you know, dreamlike. And they like to journey. They like to do shamanic things. They like to do art, whatever it is. And they, and they just respond to that dreamlike world. So there's exercises for that. One of my very favorite exercises in this book is called Sitting with Dogs, and it has to do with when something annoys you, 
It's to take that to find a quiet hot spot and recall the situation and really feel the feelings of how did I feel annoyed? What went through my body? You know, did my was my heart racing? Were my muscles tensing? Really get very physical and to feel those emotions and to sit with them. And it sounds easy, but I will tell you by doing this, by sitting with uncomfortable emotions, something happens. And if you can stay with it for a relatively short time, a minute or two, those emotions start to dissolve. And you suddenly move into a larger, more open space of understanding. So that's one of my favorite exercises that you can uh, do for any situation. Um, that's what works best for me, but there's other ones in the book um, if you prefer to, you know, <laughs> be logical, be rational, or be dreamy, or, um, you know, there's some that are very physical, dancing <laughs> like an animal, taking on those, those animal characteristics and learning from it. So, yeah, there's a lot of concrete ways to deal with, um, to work with our shadow and to really invite it inside of us so that we can better understand it. Well, it's it's um, it's a phenomenal book. I just I just noticed we're just about out of time. Um, mm-hmm. If um, you want to give out, you know, your website and how you can be contacted and stuff like that for people who want to find your sure. Book. Yeah, my website is animalvoices.net. That's animal v o i c e s dot net. And um, that's really the easiest way to contact me. My email's on there. I have a lot of excerpts from all of my books, so you can read a little bit, um, you know, if you're just, if you're interested or if you want to buy something, there's links to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, et cetera, my publisher. Um, yeah, so that's probably the best, animalvoices.net. Go there. <laughs> well, I... I... I think your book is is phenomenal. I have it, you know, and, and I do go back and reread certain areas every now and then because it's like, ha, huh, that that makes great sense. <laughs> uh-huh. But oh, oh, by great. the way, I did send I did I did send you the um, the author connection to that book we had spoken about earlier. Um, okay, great. But I want to thank you. I want to thank you again so very much because this is. This is important. People should pay attention. People should buy this book and learn from it because it's it's just an amazing adventure and and it's going to wake you up to a whole bunch of great stuff. And you're, it, don't worry, you'll never lose all of your shadow, but you might lighten the load just a little bit. <laughs> okay. Well, it was great talking with you, Barb. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you so much. And um, I will definitely, uh, this will be up on YouTube, and people can go back and listen again and hopefully buy the book too. So thank you, everybody, for listening. It's been a joy again to talk to Dawn. And um, I will be back, uh, we'll be back tomorrow evening too. So do check back then. Until then, have a great night and uh, do some thinking about what revolts you and, and see if you can't figure out what you have to learn from it. Um, So good night, everybody, and thanks again for listening.